but there is a lot of buzz about adrenal health, adrenal fatigue, adrenal downregulation, however you would like to term it. But there's a lot of information and a lot of people looking at and treating and testing for adrenal health. Um, we're going to dive into uh, some of the basic physiology and then do some cursory overview with some more in-depth physiology about the adrenals. Um, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to understanding the body. I feel that if you have, if you know the how, you can understand what's going on and then kind of reverse engineer um, accordingly. So that's kind of what we're gonna go over today. So we're gonna talk. Um, and basically there are two layers to the adrenal glands. You have your outer cortex, which will, you know, if you wanna get into the specifics of the physiology, the outer cortex breaks down into three layers your zona glomerulosa, zona uh, reticularis, excuse me, zona fascicularis and zona reticularis. Um, and those basically, each layer re releases certain hormones. Um, we'll discuss those in detail, but it's basically from the outside working in, it'll release aldosterone, which we'll talk about that, release the famed cortisol that everyone knows about. Um, and it also released your androgens, yes, your sex hormone. So to release some testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, we're gonna talk about all of these, okay? Um, and then we get into the inner layer where you can see the arrows pointing to the adrenal medulla. This releases your catecholamines. So this is your fight or flight response, adrenaline and noradrenaline. Um, so that's like, that's the response. A lot of people think that the cortisol is the response, you know, running from the tiger, right? We, you know, some, some, something's here spooking us, we either fight or flight. But it's really the adrenal medulla that's in response to that, not your cortisol. The analogy I give is cortisol is a little bit of your long lasting stress response. It's more of the drip effect is what I would term it as. Whereas your, the adrenals, or excuse me, the medulla is your quick response. I need to run or I need to fight because my life's in danger. That's where the, the catecholamines and your adrenaline and noradrenaline or epinephrine, norepinephrine, depending uh, if you're across seas, that's how you term it. So that's some basic physiology. I know I mentioned a lot of words there. We're gonna dive in, into a little bit more detail about some of that, um, that physiology, okay? Okay, so like we talked about, one of the big buzzwords when it comes to adrenals is cortisol and cortisol response, okay? So some, um, some key points here, cortisol is a glucocorticosteroid, okay? So there's a couple key words there. First, gluco. So basically when cortisol is released, it's going to stimulate your glucose. It will raise your glucose. So when we're talking about blood sugar stability and we're talking about diabetes or hypoglycemia, you have to make sure we talk about your adrenals and cortisol and see at least what aspect of that is playing into your glucose, okay? The next aspect is it's a corticoid, okay? So it's a steroid. It is a steroid. It is an anti-inflammatory molecule. So it will help with inflammation and downregulating inflammation. Um, I'll get to the pathway in a little bit, but basically cortisol can be shift into cortisone, which is everyone knows, you know, you bust up your knee, you go to the orthopedist, he puts a cortisone injection in there, anti-inflammatory to help decrease the inflammation from the damage, okay? Um, and then some, other aspects here that we want to address is when levels are high, when we notice cortisol levels are high, we're going to notice we have more bone demineralization. So typically if you're a female who's concerned about your bone health, it's important to evaluate your cortisol levels. If they're high, it's going to be hard to maintain healthy bone, uh, healthy bone structure because you're going to be constantly breaking down or uh, having bone resorption. Okay, so cortisol is a catabolic hormone. So whenever you think about catabolic, think breakdown, okay? And then we have, uh, it's also gonna break down barriers, meaning blood-brain barriers, digestive barriers. So again, remember, 
cortisol, catabolic, it breaks down. So it can break down digestive, digestive barriers. So if cortisol is constantly high, you may notice digestive symptoms correlate with that. Obviously, there has been, uh, and, and also in connection, there has been um, research that has showed people on antidepressants, so meaning they're having anxiety, they're having um, cognitive issues. When they, when they measure their blood cortisol levels, they're, they're high. So indicating that high cortisol will disrupt blood-brain barrier integrity, leading to various neurological issues, if it's depression, anxiety, that, that spectrum of symptoms, okay? Um, we talked about insulin spikes. So remember, it's a glucocorticosteroid, glucose. It's going to spike your glucose. It's gonna cause higher levels of glucose in the blood. So we may be looking at, for the, for the example, connect the dots here. You may run your glucose and look at your glucose, look at your hemoglobin A1C, evaluate the pancreas and say, man, how come I, I'm not controlling my diabetes better? How come I'm not controlling my blood sugar? What am I missing here? It's important that we evaluate your adrenal function and if that's one of the missing pieces to controlling your blood glucose or your blood sugar, okay? Um, and then the key piece here that everyone, I think this is why everyone talks about cortisol, is because of increasing fat storage. So cortisol, this is where we get a little bit tricky. I don't, I don't wanna try to lose you here, but remember, cortisol raises glucose in the blood, right? We're, everyone's got that aspect. Well, if glucose is high in your blood, it's going to tell the pancreas, I need to release insulin, okay? And this is all you have to know. Insulin means fat storage. Insulin means fat storage. So if you have high blood glucose, which could be driven from the high cortisol, it's going to signal to the pancreas we need to release insulin, okay? And then this is where we can get into the snowball of you know, insulin resistance and then uh, possibly type two diabetes, okay? So that's a key aspect to look at. But we can't demonize cortisol all the time for, for high cortisol. We also have to address low cortisol, okay? Low cortisol, remember the aspect that, that cortisol can be shuttled into cortisone. So at times of stress, we need cortisol. We need cortisol to create, uh, to create an ant the anti-inflammatory molecule of cortisone, okay? So let's not demonize it. If it's low, we do, I, do want, I do want it in a nice normal range for the anti-inflammatory aspect. Also, we can notice um, we can notice hypoglycemic pressure events. Again, all relating to the glucose in the blood. If we have inefficient glucose glucose in the blood, everyone has had that experience when you haven't had a meal for a long period of time and you feel lightheaded, you feel sluggish, almost like you're going to faint. That is most likely a hypoglycemic event. Again, cortisol can help regulate that and, and bring the blood glucose up in the blood. And then this is just a molecule of glucose. So again, talking about um, a molecule of cortisol, excuse me. Um, talking about cortisol here, we want to realize if this is a di release in a diurnal rhythm. So all that means is that every day it's released highest in the morning and it starts to taper off as the day goes okay and then it rinses and repeats so you can see highest upon waking with sunrise sunrise will stimulate cortisol and as we go through the day it should start to teeter off and then you can see it rinses and repeats so important for us more from a uh, a practitioner standpoint because you want to see what the regulation you want to see what that diurnal rhythm looks like because we want to be able to mimic it and match it um, as appropriately as possible. But just interesting to know, so you should have, again, that cortisol highest in the morning and tapers down throughout the night. You do not want to see a high cortisol, uh, high cortisol at night. So if you're that type of person that puts their head on the pillow and the brain doesn't shut off and you're just going and going, hey, I've got to do that, I have to 
do this. Oh wait, this is on my t- this is on my agenda tomorrow. That's what we call ruminating. Okay, and that's typically what we see with a high cortisol response at night. Okay, um, so that's something to be aware of. Okay, and again, we talk about cortisol so much. I want to make sure we don't put so much attention just on cortisol. The other hormones and prohormone. I had that. You know, be uh, correct there because pregnenolone is not considered a hormone. It's considered a pro-hormone, meaning it just helps other hormones. And I'll talk about this because when we look at adrenals, a lot of people miss, or a lot of the practitioners miss this piece of the adrenals, uh, your, which is your pregnenolone. Um, but like we talked about in the zona glomerulosa of the uh, outer cortex, we release aldosterone. Aldosterone is very crucial for regulating blood pressure and for regulating balance. So if you ever notice tests that practitioners use, but you might have noticed this, you know, you're in a laying position or you're seated for a while, or maybe you're laying down and you get up too quickly, orthostatic hypotension is typically what it's called. Well, if the adrenals are out of balance, we typically notice a correlation with with that, that people have, who are, have more adrenal dysregulation, they have more of that orthostatic hypotension. Big word for meaning laying down, you get up too quickly, you get dizzy, okay? And that ties into aldosterone. Next, we talk about our sex hormones. This is released from the zona, um, the zona reticulata, the most inner layer. So this release, our estrogen, our progesterone, our, te- our testosterone, our DHEA, dihydroepi andosterone, okay? Um, these are sex hormones. I, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. Sex hormones are extremely crucial for obviously our maturity, our development, um, for procreation, for neuronal health, uh, progesterone and testosterone and estrogen. Um, guys, we have it too. It's really crucial for healthy skin and other synergistic effects with our, with our sex hormones, okay? Um, catecholamines, we briefly talked about that. Remember, that's the inner layer of the adrenal gland. That's the fight or flight. Tigers in the room, either run or fight, okay? And then our pregnenolone, which is a pro-hormone, okay? We're gonna talk about this right now in more detail because I feel like this is missed too often and it needs to be given a little bit more attention. So you got, I expect everyone to repeat this entire diagram by the end of, the, uh, of today's talk, okay? Um, so the, the, the aspect here is what I want you to notice is, look what starts this whole cascade. Pregnenolone, the pro-hormone. So if we have inadequate amounts of your pregnenolone, good luck trying to make all of this. It starts here, and before that, even before that, I know you might not be able to see what it says. It says cholesterol. So adequate fats. We tend to demonize fats. We tend to demonize. That's a whole other discussion, but making sure we're getting adequate fats to give the precursors to make pregnenolone, okay? And then the other piece, so that just ties in. I just want to connect the dot with pregnenolone, but it also ties in. I want to give you a little bit of a tip here on why, why, cortisol might downregulate. okay? So all I want you to see here is that there's an arrow that will start to go to progesterone here, and instead of it going down cortisol, it'll shuttle back into some of our other sex hormones, okay? So there's this old analogy. I rather, basically, I, it's my analogy, I'm making it up, but I rather i rather live to fight another day than to procreate, okay? Once I'm in a safe environment, once I know I'm safe, then I can worry about procreation. But first and foremost, I'm going to prioritize survival. And that's what tends to happen. Um, Some of you may have heard this word before. It's called pregnenolone steel. So basically, all it means is we're gonna prioritize shifting our pregnenolone to our sex hormones rather than our cortisol and rather than um, some of our adrenal hormones because we're gonna prioritize survival rather than procreation. So that being said, we need to 
It's just connecting the dot here that we need to make sure that we're not just looking solely at adrenal glands here. When, if we're having an adrenal uh, issue, we need to look at sex hormones as well. Because if we're constantly trying to fulfill the, the adrenal hormones, and this is just still being uh, depleted, we're still gonna have, we're still gonna have issues with con conversion. All that to say is that um, we wanna try to get you out of that response from running from the tiger, okay? Unfortunately, in today's society, we're always running from the tiger. We have the chronic tiger, okay? Um, I, wish, I wish I had, I wish I had a, I wish it wasn't so. I wish I could say, oh, nope, you've got a tumor. Oh, you've got, a, you know, adrenocorticotropic downregulation, uh, you know, but we're really, the, the skinny of it is we're just constantly on the go. We're constantly stimulated. We have a, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm here calling myself out too. I'm there at times. I have to check myself, but we're constantly on the phone. We're constantly trying to make this meeting. We're constantly, you know, I, the analogy, like, I feel like we're uh, in the circus and we're the, the disc spinner and that we're, we're spinning a bunch of discs all at once. That's how I feel I am. I guess that joke didn't go over well, but anyways. <laughs> Uh, so, so that's that aspect. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about a little bit more of the, pro, the conventional uh, diagnoses with the adrenal glands. I want to make sure we talk about this before we go into what I typically see. These issues we're typically not going to see, okay? You're, you're typically not going to see them. Um, you should know about them. I hope you know about them before, before they get to me, but but it has happened. So the mo most common issues with the adrenal glands are going to be Cushing's disease, Adson's disease, phenochromocytoma, everyone say it with me, no. Uh, and then other various, other various tumors, basically. So Cushing disease, all it means is high cortisol. You have chronically high cortisol, um, and the symptoms are mainly you get like a buffalo hump, you get moon facies, uh, you have uh, constant sugar cravings, um, you have a lot of adiposity around the abdomen because cortisol likes to live in the, the, the belly, okay? Um, and you have high blood sugar, right? Then, so some testing you typically do, you can run, you run your salivary cortisol, you run your um, blood cortisol, you run your adrenocorticotropic hormone. So there's ways to assess that, but I just want you to be aware uh, of, of some primary issues. Adson's disease. This is what John F. Kennedy had. He had low, too low of cortisol. He suffered from this. So uh, it causes like really um, uh, darkening of the skin, dark pigmentation. Uh, it causes nausea, diarrhea, vomiting. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Uh, phenochromocytoma, all it is is a big word for a tumor in the middle of the adrenal gland. So you have, um, you have those symptoms of like you're running from the tiger, sweating, pupil, uh, pupil dilation, um, increased heart rate, increased hypertension, or increased blood pressure. So those are things just to be, to be aware of. And then you can have various tumors that causes um, that causes certain hormones to secrete, whether it's the cortisol, a, a tumor causing cortisol secretion, a tumor causing aldosterone secretion, a tumor ca causing androgen secretion. So that's something just to be aware of. I just wanted to make sure we talked about that. Um, so some adrenal symptoms, okay? Things to be aware of, okay? Uh, the big one is fatigue and low energy. Um, if you notice again that orthostatic hypertension, you get up, you're getting dizzy constantly, lightheaded, vertigo, low blood pressure aspect, chronic colds and viruses. Again, you're constantly running from that, that proverbial tie. Um, difficulty to lose weight because if our blood sugar isn't stable and we're constantly releasing insulin, good luck, to lo good luck losing weight. That's not going to happen. Um, unexplained food cravings, again, going back to blood sugar stability. Um, and then uh, hormonal regulations. We kind of talked briefly about how that can be tied in here. 
So those can be, uh, and then, you know, what does that mean exactly from a symptom, a symptomology standpoint? Mood swings, irritability, um, a food cravings can, can tie into it. Females, if you're cycling and you're, you're having severe abdominal cramping, if you're having extended bleeding, if you're having uh, uh, migraines or headaches in relation to your cycle or ovulation. So those are things to be aware of. Okay, so my analogy here. So again, I'm going to go back to the proverbial tiger. Like, why is it, the, you know, the question is, why can my, my wife go and do, you know, take care of three kids, have a full-time job, you know, uh, cook, market, and, and do, uh, do marketing for, for business, um, um, and she has no issues. She can sleep well. Her blood sugar, sugar is great. Her weight's great. Why is it? Why is it me? Unfortunately, it comes to the analogy I love to give is the stress bucket. Well, unfortunately, your wife has a 10-gallon stress bucket. She can. She her adrenals can tolerate that. Maybe you have a five-gallon stress bucket. Maybe you can only handle half the things. So maybe you can only handle, you know, taking care of the kids part of the time, cooking part of the time. Um, don't use this as an excuse. Uh, honey, I have adrenal down regulation. I can't, I can't cook tonight, sorry. So, so let's not go there. But, but it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the stress bucket. It's the stress bucket. You have too much on your plate. And you know what? It may need to be as simple as let's step back a little bit. You know, let's stop, let's stop with you know, all the, the, I have to do this, I have to do this, let's back down and let's give your body a little bit of he healing time and stop, you know, stop with the gas pedal to the floor 24 seven. Sometimes it can be as simple as that with some of my patients, okay? All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit here about that. If you guys, re if you guys remember, I mentioned that HPA axis right at the very beginning, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And I want to, before I go into that, I want to quickly touch upon, uh, in the beginning, um, it said adrenal fatigue or, or adrenal downregulation. So I, adrenal fatigue is uh, the, like a very like eye-catching word. It's the re really what's going on is your adrenals are downregulating. They're not working as efficiently as they should. So I just want to make sure we have the correct vernacular when we're, when we're communicating, okay? So back to the HPA axis. The hypothalamic, anterior pituitary, but pituitary is the, is the P, and then A is the adrenal axis. So adrenal cortex or the adrenal uh, medulla, whatever, uh, depending what you're looking on. So I want you to think of this as like a telephone line. Okay, you have a signal, signal sent through, and then it goes to, the analogy I like to use is goes to the TV, right? Everyone knows they have to plug their cable in and then it, it goes to the TV, right? So here's the start of your plug. All the way down here is your TV, okay? And we have um, electrical impulses in the release of, of certain neuro, uh, neurotransmitters or certain transmitters here. So from the hypothalamus, which is the, the um, higher functioning of the brain, that's what separates us from like, from other animals is our higher functioning brain, okay? Then we release something called corticotropin releasing hormone, okay? That then signals the anterior pituitary to release something called adrenocorticotropic, um, adrenocorticotropic hormone here, so AC, ATC, ACTH. Then it basically tells the adrenals to release cortisol or whatever that hormone is, okay? So all of that to say that this is like an electrical, an electrical wire. And this wire can get snipped at various areas. So we kind of, we, we tend to go and say, nope, it's the adrenals. It's always the adrenal gland that's the issue. It may not necessarily be the, be the adrenal gland that's down-regulating. It may be that the signal's not getting there, okay? So that's a, a, a key point that people tend to miss is that it's not always the gland itself. 
it may be the wiring. The wiring may be off, okay? To make it more complicated, <laughs> so now we have the HPA, now we have the HPG, which stands for hypothalamic pituitary gonadal access, and then we have the HPT, hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. I don't want you to get confused here, but I just want you to be able to see they all are connected at the hypothalamus. So they all can interact, they all can tie into one another. So all of this to say is it's really important when we're evaluating the adrenal glands that you're having someone that's doing blood work that's looking at your sex hormones, that's looking at your thyroid function, because they play into each other. There's, our, our, that's what makes the human body so amazing and so fascinating. It's not that the adrenals play in their own little sandbox and they don't, they don't interact with anyone. The sex hormone doesn't play in its own little sand sandbox and doesn't interact. They all interact with one another. They all are inter intertwined in some way or some signaling pathway. If you're with a practitioner and you're concerned about adrenal downregulation, then we're looking at sex hormones. We're looking at thyroid function. Okay, and then I think everyone I think everyone knows this that um, you know food is crucial. You, you know. You, you are what you eat. I truly believe that. So, you know, um, I highly doubt anyone is eating all of this if you're here tonight and you're giving your time. But just to being aware that digestive health does play into adrenal axis. If, you're in a con if your stomach is in a constant fight or flight and you're feeding food that's constantly causing inflammation and causing intestinal damage, your stomach is always running from that proverbial tiger, right? So then it another aspect that influences the adrenals, okay? I just wanted to make sure I touched upon that. Um, and again, so this picture is, again, just making that connection that it might not always be the TV. It might not always be the adrenals. It could be the wiring. It could be someone came by and was just, no, you're not having adrenal function today. I'm snipping that. So, there, so it's, there's ways to address, there's ways to address um, the wiring Okay, there's ways to address the wiring. I just want to bring relevance that it might not always be the TV. It might not always be the gland itself. Okay. And then testing. Okay, we got to make sure we test. We're not, I, I always tell my patients that I want some quantitative data to go off of. I don't want to just be, you know, uh, guess and check. I just don't want to throw it on the wall and hope it sticks. We want to make sure we have some information to go off of. We want to make sure we have something not only to evaluate at beginning, but evaluate at end as well. Okay. So some of the testing we do, um, we're going to make sure, like we talked about, we're going to check your sex hormones. So we make sure we look at your progesterone, your estrogen. We make sure we look at your DHEA, that dihydroepiandosterone, DHEA. We make sure we check your pregnenolone, okay? And we make sure we do, we check your cortisol. Very crucial to check your cortisol. Um, we'll do it a couple ways. We can do a single blood sample. Um, if you wanna just get a quick and dirty, easy result, I typically recommend doing a, um, a, four, a four test sample so you're getting that you're getting a look at that diurnal rhythm that we talked about, really important. Um, we'll also do um, ACTH, the adrenocorticotropic horm uh, hormone, important that we measure that because we're trying to look at the circuitry, how well is the signal being sent, okay? Really important. So here is, um, it's a little bit blurry, but here is one of the tests that we do. This is the four sample test. Um, this is a urine test. Um, if you think you have Cushing's or Addison's or a, uh, a tumor, you will be required anywhere you go, they're gonna wanna run blood and urine to include or exclude that diagnosis. So we run urine uh, a fair amount of the times. And as you can see over here, it gives us a four point sample, okay? and. Don't worry about this half, but basically you think of this, this is the morning. We want it highest in the morning and it should slowly teeter down the night, 
okay? Um, and you can tell here we get a, co a free cortisol and a to total cortisol. This patient was a little bit on the higher end of cortisol, so she had too much of a, a cortisol response. Uh, she had a little bit of, uh, her main complaints were a little bit of a weight issues, uh, blood sugar instability, kind of makes sense when we look at this, right? And then um, she was in menopause, so there were some issues going on there with estrogen and progesterone support. But I just wanna give you some flavor to what kind of testing we do, okay? All right, now for the good stuff, some tips, okay? So nutritionally, if you wanna start somewhere, paleo template, really easy to follow. If you're wondering what it is, uh, probably majority of you know exactly what it is. No grains, no legumes, no dairy, plain and simple. So patients ask me, what can I have? Meats, veggies, fruits in moderation, lots of, um, lots of sweet potato, lots of coconut, um, almond milk, uh, almond uh, or coconut milk, and you're good, you're good to go, okay? Um, get enough sleep. I know this seems like, Doc, you had to tell me that. People don't realize how many people come in and like, yeah, I get, I'm, I'm okay, that's fine, right? No, no, let's get, like shoot for seven and a half and have good sleep hygiene. Have good sleep hygiene. So that means, you know, about 45 minutes, half an hour to bed, you know, don't have that screen in your face. Step away from the screen. Um, if you wanna read a book, read a book. If you wanna listen to some music, if you wanna meditate, that's, I, that, was, that was my, 2019 goal, I've maintained it. A Medi little meditation at night does wonders. Um, calms down a very uh, constant mind. Um, make sure you, the, the room's a good temperature. Make sure your pillow's comfortable. Make sure the bed's comfortable. Make sure the bed, you haven't had the same bed for the past you know, 10, 15 years. Um, some, you know, the trash truck comes by every Tuesday. You have earplugs. Like, I know this sounds really simple, but it's the simple things that make such big changes. The devil is in the details. I really do believe that. Um, um, if you need a sleep app sound or you need something in the background to, to, to be black, uh, white noise, absolutely go for it. Hydration, half your body weight in fluid ounces. I know that sounds like a lot, but it's a goal I want my patients to shoot for. So if I'm 200 pounds, 100, trying to shoot for 100 fluid ounces a day. Okay, live with a canteen. Um, I recommend a hydro flask, something that is um, that something that's not plastic and can be heated up and leach BPA. But have a canteen next to you wherever you go. I always choose like really bright, vibrant colors um, because it catches my eye. And every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, I gotta drink some water. Okay, um, add salt to add salt to your water in the morning. A little bit of pink Himalayan salt, about a tea, uh, a teaspoon to a half teaspoon. That helps take a little bit of pressure off the adrenals because it doesn't have to release aldosterone because your salt will help regulate blood pressure as well. So to take a little pressure off the adrenals with releasing aldosterone, a little bit of uh, good pink Himalayan, uh, Celtic, uh, Celtic, like that will be helpful. Um, try to avoid caffeine past noon, okay? Caffeine stim is a stimulatory, but most importantly, the caffeine will bind to ATP receptors in the brain. So not only, not only do you get that afternoon lull, but if you are binding, uh, if you're blocking ATP receptors in the brain, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to produce energy. You're not going, you're going to have that, that low, um, that low dip even further. So make sure you avoid uh, caffeine past afternoon. Okay. Adding adaptogens, this is a nice little piece. So what is adaptogens? They're really interesting. Um, I definitely, you know, I definitely would love for, um, uh, I know Dr. Erin probably knows a lot more on adaptogens. This is her, that, that's her baby. Um, but adaptogens basically, they, I use them a lot if we have a lot of uh, the circuitry issues going on. They're very helpful with the rewiring rather than the, the TV. So you can use various adaptogens, cordyceps, ginseng, uh, reishi. Um, there's various other um, 
adapted into use, but those are just a couple uh, to comment on. Uh, correct exercise prescription, okay? If you have adrenal downregulation, please don't be going on the treadmill and running for two hours, okay? You need to have correct exercise prescription, so you're better off doing a little bit anaerobic activity, meaning um, a little bit of a little bit of more weight training or plyometrics, just trying to stay away from that chronic, that chronic aerobic response, okay? Um, and, and even some patients, we may have to back you off exercise for a little while uh, to repair the adrenals to get you back into, you know, working. So just, just be aware of that, okay? Um, and then some other things we can do, if you have low cortisol, licorice root was very helpful for bringing up cortisol, okay? Uh, somewhere around 100 milligrams um, TID three times a day is, is pretty good. Uh, B vitamins are going to be affected a lot, so uh, enhancing with B vitamins. And then if you notice you're that patient that it is that ruminating patient, heads against the pillow and your con mind's constantly going, a little bit of phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidylserine helps to attenuate or downregulate that cortisol response. That's phosphat phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidylserine is really helpful. Um, and, and that's basically it there. Those are, the, those are the big tips, the big take-homes and takeaways that I would, I would recommend. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Please don't hesitate to ask. And... Um, and yeah, I just think it's adrenals is, is something that should be looked at. Um, if you have, you know, any of those symptoms, you're fatigued, you're having issues with blood sugar stability, you're having orthostatic hypertension, you're having that uh, afternoon dip, uh, severe dip in energy, um, hormone fluctuation, really big weight gain. So just things to be, things to be aware of um, when you're thinking about your overall health.